Friday. It's 9-10. Welcome back. Hour number uh, four here. Big 550 KTRS. Uh, once a week, once every two weeks, we have Jennifer Blom on, and that's enough for me. Our next guest spent 22 years next to the woman. That deserves extra combat pay. Good friend of the show. He's at Channel 5. Art Holiday. welcome back to Big 550 KTRS. Good morning. How are you? We're doing great. Um, you've been on the show numerous times talking about this movie with uh, Johnny. <laughs> with, this is Johnny. I, don't, I, I didn't mean that as a negative. I just meant it. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a well p- now that's... That's kind of the way it's gone with this project. <laughs> <laughs> and and lo- everyone knows you from Channel 5. Some people know you that, that you're a sort of a, uh, a movie uh, filmmaker, uh, one of your passions, and you've been working on this uh, Johnny Johnson film with, with Chuck Berry, and we thought we'd get you on because you probably know more about all this stuff than anybody. So first of all, where are we with the film? Uh, the film is completed, although I, I'm I, my uh, my... One of my goals, I'm trying to get a hold of Quentin Tarantino for a possible interview uh, about uh, the uh, the scene in Pulp Fiction where uh, You Never Can Tell by Chuck Berry is playing and Uma Thurman and uh, John Travolta are dancing. And in the middle of it, there's a piano solo by Johnny Johnson. And I wanted to find out the backstory of that. But the film is done. Uh, now I'm trying to figure out the business side of it and the legal side of it because there's a lot of copyrighted material. And um, in terms of the subject matter this morning, uh, Chuck Berry, um, I've had uh, some difficulty getting permission to use his music. So I don't want to go into a, a whole lot of great detail about that. But uh, So I have a completed film, but I've got to figure out uh, how not to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have it, but only you've seen it, in other words. Um, well, I mean, a handful of people have seen it. Some of the people who are in the film have seen it, some of the musicians, because I wanted to get some feedback, uh, specifically about the way Chuck Berry is treated in the film. Because when I first began working on it, there was uh, concern voiced by some people that uh, I was attempting to rewrite history. Right. Um, and my contention all along is I wanted to examine history, um, you know, when Johnny Johnson called Chuck Berry in 1952 uh, because he needed a, a last-minute replacement for a New Year's Eve gig at the Cosmopolitan Club in East St. Louis, that was one of the most famous phone calls in rock and roll because that's the first time they played together, and the rest literally was rock and roll history after that. Johnny Johnson and Chuck Berry getting together made St. Louis one of the birthplaces of rock and roll. And the the death of Chuck Berry is causing us to reflect about that, and I hope that's something that is meaningful to music fans in St. Louis. You know, you got the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, um, and, you know, perhaps rightfully so, but there there are multiple birthplaces of rock and roll, and St. Louis is at the very top of the list because of... Chuck Berry and Johnny Johnson getting together. Let's. Uh, uh, so I want to talk more about Johnny Johnson and Chuck Berry, but I want to talk about the, uh, the film for another second or two. And that sure. is, um, how much? Let's see if if we can find someone to be a uh, to be a patron of the arts or something here. How much m- money do you need to finish the film? <laughs> uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know exactly. My estimate is that it would probably be. Uh, you know, probably in the half million dollar range. Wow. Could be, could be, could be less, could be more. And, and here's the reason why. You know, I've uh, there are probably uh, clips of um, I would say somewhere thirty, thirty five, maybe forty songs that uh, I'm attempting to use. Uh, I have. Uh, I want to use film clips from Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, which is owned by Universal. Uh, what you run into frequently with films like this is that all the copyrighted material is owned by, in large part, big media companies. And their number one goal is to make money. Right. You know, I mean, that's just the way it works. So uh, if you, unless you're willing to invoke uh, the legal doctrine fair use, and argue that um, uh, you know that I should be able to use the the music uh, or some of the copyrighted material uh, for free, uh, then you've got to be prepared to pay. 
and uh, fair use makes distributors and uh, other entities a little nervous sometimes. So, but but, so, but 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 you could sell this to HBO, and then they would then help you with all the copyright stuff. Uh, do you have a phone number for Sheila Evans at HBO? I'll be happy to talk to her. Uh, Art, let's talk. <laughs> what about? I was just I was just saying HBO, Netflix, or something on those lines yeah. could, could well, that, sort of pick then, it up. That's the goal. Uh, and right now, I'm I'm trying to um, I'm trying to uh, find a distributor who will. Uh, handle this for me because this is all foreign territory for me i'm sure a lot of people who heard these multiple interviews over the years are wondering what's taking this guy so long well you know i mean every day i'm doing something for the first time <laughs> right right and it's very it's it, it can be quite complicated uh, Art Holiday or Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Big Five Fifty KTRS. <laughs> so let's so let's talk about the the pairing of the uh, the two here. Um, you, you go back and you listen to the music over the weekend, like I did, and you hear the piano of Johnny Johnson and you hear the guitar of uh, Chuck Berry, and it, it's I mean, uh, to the uh, for the for the first time maybe I really heard it uh, this weekend. You can't really have one without the other, it seems like. Well, as a couple of people in my film uh, pointed out, um, Chuck Berry probably would have been a star whether he met Johnny Johnson or not because he had he had talent, he had great uh, uh, writing ability in terms of lyrics, he was driven, but the music wouldn't have sounded the same. If you go back and listen to... Um, to any of those great songs that Johnny's playing on, they there was there was an intuition between the two of them. Chuck would play, and you know there's always there's always spaces where a musician isn't playing or isn't singing, and that's when you hear Johnny. You know Johnny's filling in all the blank spaces. You know that's when he shows off his incredible piano playing, and those two brought out the best in each other. Um, you could, uh, you know, there, my film deals with the songwriting controversy, uh, in part, uh, in the early two thousands, uh, Johnny, uh, was convinced by people around him to sue Chuck Berry claiming that, um, he should have received songwriting credit for around 50 songs that, uh, he alleges they, they wrote together and he helped supply the melodies for them. Um, you know, that's, that's a big part of the the discussion um you know is is that what happened well you know in in large part we'll probably never know right because the two people who know they're not with us anymore so i was reading johnny in 2005 and and chuck berry over the weekend i was reading over the weekend in one of his obituaries where he gave alan is this true where he gave alan freed the dj some songwriting credits so that Alan Freed would then play the songs on the radio? Well, that was on Maybelline. That was on their very first hit. And I don't know that I think it might be a stretch to say that Barry gave it to him. Um, I think it was it was one of those deals where um, Alan Freed, uh, it, 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 it's a form of payola, right. basically. Uh, pay to play. So in order to get uh, radio airplay, which is what, you know, that's the engine that makes a hit record if you're playing it over and over and over again on the radio. Well, Alan Freed said, I'll do that, but I want uh, songwriting credit. And so they went along with it, but after that, that was the catalyst for Chuck Berry becoming the savvy music businessman that he became. You know, he said, well, you know, Alan Freed wasn't anywhere around when we wrote this song, <laughs> you know, and there, and there was actually a third name on there. And I, I forgive me. I, I don't have it committed to memory, but there were, there were two other people listed as songwriters on Maybelline and, and Chuck Berry said, well, okay, you fooled me once, but this isn't going to happen again. And so he educated himself about the business of songwriting and formed his own publishing company. No other artists were doing that. I mean, so Chuck Berry not only was a great musician and performer, but he was an he was a very very savvy businessman. Uh, Russ Frado, I think, was the other name. Who was, yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, you're, you're correct. Yes. <laughs> uh, so did you, did you ever get to talk to Chuck Berry in for the movie? 
Uh, I talked to him once. Uh, this was less than a year before Johnny died. The two of us went to uh, Blueberry Hill uh, for one of Chuck Berry's many performances there. Uh, we met with him backstage. And uh, to, to make a long story short, uh, I explained that I wanted to interview him for the film, that I wanted to uh, license some of his music, and that I wanted him and Johnny to perform together and let me include that uh, in the film. And he gave me all of his contact information, and uh, I was under the uh, mistaken impression that we had made some progress following that conversation. Uh, the next time I heard from uh, the Barry Camp was from uh, his one of his attorneys, saying that uh, if Chuck didn't have script approval, uh, he wasn't interested in being part of the film. Hmm. So that that was the one and only time that I met Chuck Berry and discussed Johnny Be Good. Yeah, uh, living in Wentzville, so he'd go to the supermarket and you'd be looking for some apples in the produce section, and you'd run across the man who invented rock and roll buying buying melons next to you. Uh, you know, I suppose at some point you got to eat, right? So, <laughs> unless somebody else is doing the shopping for him, yeah, you're going to run into him at the grocery store. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, you just wouldn't think you would run into the, you know, the man who invented rock and roll right there, you know. You know, uh, ex excuse me, Mr. Berry, can I have, uh, you know, can I have an onion, please? Um, so, were you weren't a movie, you weren't a music guy. Uh, before you, you started this, what was the reason you wanted to get into the movies? Well, um, a couple of reasons. I mean, I'm, I'm a music fan, you know, so I wasn't necessarily looking for a music documentary because they're really challenging, as we discussed earlier. Right. Um, but a co-worker of mine, uh, Tony Chambers, one of our uh, photographers at, at uh, Channel 5, uh, stopped by my desk one day and suggested that uh, Johnny Johnson might make an interesting documentary. And that's really where the, the seed was planted. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, man, when, I mean, when's the next time you're going to get to do a film and examine the life of someone who was there at the very birth of rock and roll? I mean, there's only a handful of musicians who can make that claim. And certainly Chuck Berry and Johnny Johnson are at the head of the class. You know, so that idea kind of intrigued me. And the fact that I wanted to put St. Louis's music history back into the spotlight. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that we have the Blues Museum here, but I don't think we, uh, historically over the years, we've marketed ourselves as a great music city necessarily. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, look at some of the amazing artists that we've produced. Um, you know, uh, an interesting debate would be who was more influential chuck berry or miles davis right. well, they grew up eight miles from each other mm -hmm. throw in tina turner you know, in there as well and i mean you're off and tina running turner i mean yeah. you know um uh, most of the fifth dimension was from st louis um josephine baker was from st louis uh clark terry the great trumpeter who was on the tonight show is a st louis native I mean, we, uh, you know, going all the way back to Scott Joplin and Ragtime. Yeah, well, all the way you up know, to, I mean, to we've Nelly got an incredible today. Yeah. Musical history, no, and so that was part of the attraction too. Yeah. yeah. So Art Holiday from from Channel Five. Uh, earlier today, we had on one of the curators of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Howard Kramer, and he said we were talking about in 1955. You're listening to the radio and you're listening to one song, and then all of a sudden Chuck Berry comes on, and it was like this it was like an alien sort of dropped in from from planet neptune because the music was so different and he said something interesting to me he said chuck berry was hiding in plain sight because that was the african-american music that the white teenage kids weren't exposed to and so radio exposed these kids to this african-american music that had been around for a while but radio exposed it to them for the first time with chuck berry well, I think uh, anyone who has studied history recognizes that uh, it was, um, I'll diplomatically say this, it was challenging for black artists to reach a, a white audience. And that was Chuck Berry's stated goal. I mean, he recognized that there was a pot of gold if a black artist could figure out how to reach a white audience, especially teenagers. And... The, the long-term effect of that is part of his legacy. 
you know, I mean, they they literally had ropes down the middle of concert venues with white fans on one side and black fans on another. They the powers that be didn't want white teenagers and black teenagers dancing together. Well, you know, as soon as you know Chuck Berry hit one of those famous chords and 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 the music starts rocking. Well, what do the kids do? They jump up out of their seats, and pretty soon the ropes come down, literally. Mm. And some of those kids recognize that, wow, we like the same music. We've been told that, you know, we're different and we shouldn't be together. And and all of a sudden we've got this this thing that we have in common. And then once you get in the room and once you start talking to each other, you recognize that you have more similarities than differences, which is not what they've been led to believe. And then some of those white kids go on to become freedom riders. And they literally put their lives on the line to fight for racial equality, especially in the Deep South. You know, so rock and roll, and, and Taylor Hackford, I, I forgive me for not re, uh, memorizing the exact quote, but I, I'm paraphrasing. Taylor Hackford, the movie director uh, in my film, uh, made the point that, um, that rock and roll and R&B music uh, did as much for bringing the races together as, as any other uh, facet of the civil rights movement. And some would argue that maybe that's a stretch, but I think there's a lot of truth there. Music, uh, I think we all recognize that. Music has the ability to bring people together. And Chuck Berry and Johnny Johnson were a big, big part of that. Uh, Art Holiday, I read where in the lyrics to Johnny Be Good, uh, where lived a country boy named Johnny B. Good, that, that Chuck Berry changed that from country boy. You, it was colored boy, and he changed right. it to country boy. Did you find that out? Um, I, I had read that. Uh, I, it's, it's not really something that I dealt with in the film, right. uh, but, I, but I have read that. I've heard that story. Um, you know, and a little bit about, you know, everyone always asks, well, you know, does Johnny Johnson have anything to do with Johnny B. Good? Um, it was kind of a, it was kind of a backhanded compliment or a little bit of, uh, uh, Chuck's frustration with Johnny's behavior on the road that suggested the title to him when they, um, used to have those rock and roll caravans where all the top artists would go city to city to city, you know, for much of the year playing their hit, their one hit record, um, Johnny would, after he was done, you know, playing Maybelline or, or whatever their hot song was at the time, would leave the band and go look for a jazz or a blues club where he could sit in and play. And he would literally get left behind. He would start drinking and playing and having a great time. And the next thing you know, the band's left town and Johnny's left behind. This happened multiple times. And as the legend goes, Chuck went to Johnny out of frustration and said, Johnny, why can't you just be good and stay with us? Okay, so the Johnny and Johnny Be Good is Johnny Johnson. B probably is Barry, uh, and Good, G-O-O-D-E, is Good Avenue, the street that Chuck Berry grew up on. There you go. Right from the man who created the film. Uh, Art, if I had half a million dollars, I'd give it to you. <laughs> But I don't. And, and I would take it. <laughs> I don't. And I, can, and I can make that offer because I don't have a half a million dollars. See, see? Uh, but you know what? You know what? With, this, with, this, with the passing of Chuck Berry um, and some renewed interest and some tweets from uh, some of the people in your film who some of the best of the best, you would think maybe one of these guys might shake a couple of hundred thousand dollars off of their millions and – um, or Netflix might, you know, you might find some renewed interest in this. So I would not give up hope, Art Holiday. Oh, no, no. I, you know, I, I learned a long time ago that when you're making a film, first of all, I, I've used this line many times. I tell people all the time, every time you watch a movie, you're watching a miracle. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, there's 101 ra ways for any movie production to go off the rails. And so I learned a long time ago, control what you have control over, and mostly that means just do the work. And if, if the subject matter has merit, eventually someone will, will notice and pay attention to it. So 
it was a it was an incredible long shot from day one. But as we sit here today discussing my film, I got twelve members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in my movie. Yeah, yeah. you know, I have one of the top directors in Hollywood in my movie. I have the great British actor Malcolm McDowell in my movie. You know, so obviously all these people thought that this was worth their time. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I just keep doing the work. There you go. Art Holiday with uh, Channel 5. Art, you're, uh, you're always welcome here. Good luck with everything, and we'll see you down the road. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me on. You got it. 930 here, Big 550 KTRS. Art Holiday, Labor of Love, that uh, movie, which is yet to see the light of day, but is just chock full of great information about Johnny Johnson and Chuck Berry, the passing of a legend over the weekend. 931 here, Big 550 KTRS.